Good morning. <coughs> Sorry, yeah, good, uh, good afternoon. Yeah. Let's start the lecture. So we're going to talk about new topic now. We'll move on to shaft design. Okay. <coughs> So the objective is basically uh, is to uh, uh, look at the key functions of a shaft, okay, which is a, a pretty important uh, mechanical component, particularly in terms of uh, transmitting uh, powers. Okay. Uh, in order to do a shaft design and also some components associated with shaft, for example, case, okay, uh, we have to be able to create a free body diagram. So that part of the knowledge we uh, had exercised already. Um, we need to know, uh, look at uh, the, the strengths, okay, and basically for proper size of this uh, uh, shaft. In order to do the shaft, then there's another part, basically in terms of deflection and the frequency or vibration in the shaft. So for that purpose, I think for this course, we're going to skip that. Okay, so we'll mainly look at the loading. Okay, the loading, considering basically we're going to assume the shaft has no deflection, it's a rigid shaft. Okay. Uh, this diagram we've seen uh, a number of times already. So, uh, in previous time, previous uh, lecture, it's, it's uh, the gear. So right now we are uh, still at this location. Okay. So what is the function of a shaft? Okay. Uh, a shaft is a rotating mechanical structure which basically transmitting power and motion. Okay. Uh, it, then there there are stationary shaft and there are non-stationary shaft. Right. Okay. So a shaft is, done, is also used to uh, support different kind of load. So you can uh, uh, shaft, you can carry a gear, you can carry a pulley, you can carry a sheath, you can carry a sprocket, right? So, so uh, this this is a picture of uh, um, a shaft carrying a planner arbor, okay, basically a cutting tool. Right? So when you look at this picture here, right? So one of the question is, uh, what kind of a loading condition? Uh, would you see or what kind of stress would the shaft feel okay, for this kind of system? Shear stress, what else? Shear stress will come from where? From what loading? Hmm? Torque? Yeah. What else? <laughs> Bending, yeah. And this is a pretty big cutting tool, right? Pretty heavy. And uh, this is a f not a very long distance, short duration length here. So there might be a s at this root location right there, and there might be what a so-called direct shear, right? Direct shear. So that's the possible, basically, um, uh, loading conditions and possible stresses the shaft will feel, right? Uh, here's a similar structure. Basically, it's a shaft. It's a it's a motor having an overhand the shaft and drive a belt, right? So the belt will have a tension force on it, and similarly, the uh, shaft will have a torsional shear stress and will have a bending stress, bending normal stress. Okay? Uh, you can also include direct shear in that, right? So that's very similar. It's pretty much the same thing as previous uh, slides there, right? Okay. Okay, so what kind of a components or elements does the shaft carry? Okay. Uh, we uh, we can have a gear pulley. I mentioned that coupling. We can have a bearing, belt, okay, and pulleys, flywheel, cams, seals. So almost everything, very almost all different kind of a mechanical components, right? Yeah. Loading, uh, locating elements. Okay, so now the shaft carries different components. So the question is. How would you locate all the components properly or precisely at the desired location that you want? Right. So to do that, okay, we use this. We usually, okay, uh, mostly we use this so-called shaft shoulder for precise locating of the components. What's a shoulder? Basically, uh, this is a shoulder here. Okay, this is a shoulder, and this is the shoulder. So we sometimes we call that 
uh, backup uh, shoulder. Okay. So that shoulder is essentially you have this is gear here, so that can be rigidly uh, putting against this shoulder here, right? So you want it to be here. That's very precise location, right? Okay. So, but this is just one side locating it, right? And the other side, you have you also have to locate it, so you don't want it to move along this axial direction. So this is basically a so-called spacer, and uh, uh, you place a spacer between the gear and the bearing. And we'll look at that uh, proper uh, size of the spacer. The height of spacer needs can, and it needs to be uh, has has to has to have a proper some height here. So that basically this uh, gear at here will be uh, rigidly fixed at this location, right? Yeah. And there are uh, some other ways of locating the uh, the gear. For example, you can also have a set screw at here, okay? Or you can have a snap rings around here, okay? So a retaining ring, okay. So different ways of doing it, but uh, uh, the application would be different, right? We just have to use a SAS screw. Essentially, uh, the uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, take as much of uh, loadings as a as a spacer like this, right? So uh, those are basically a number of things that you can use. You can always use a nut and a washer, and uh, there's no nut and washer here. So for example. You have the bearing in here, so right now it's using a snap ring, right, to uh, fix the bearing at this location. So this black thing, this one here's a snap ring. Or sometimes people use this. You can uh, thread this shaft location in here, and then use a nut and and uh, basically uh, um, and the nut and the bolts in here to fix the bearing at the location. Okay, yeah. So a different way of doing it. But the bottom line is. Uh, you want to accurately position the mounted elements axially on the shaft. Okay. So here's another here's an example <coughs> showing you the example of shaft with with uh, various of attachment and some details here. <coughs> so this is a sprocket. Uh, sprocket basically it's a sort of a chained structure, so you can uh, hook it up to uh, a chain, right? And then carry uh, it's like uh, uh, the bicycle. Uh, the uh, the chains and a sprocket. Uh, here they use a clamp and uh, collar things to fix that against the shoulder edge here. Okay, yeah. So this is a pretty rigid, right? This is pretty rigid. Uh, this guy here is the K, which was called the uh, Woodruff K. Later we'll we'll learn that. So this Woodruff K here uh, will uh, basically function as a, a coupling or a, a, a power transfer. Uh, between the shaft and the gear. Okay, so basically, uh, the shaft probably driven by a motor. Then uh, the motor, right, will the shaft rotates, and the Woodruff K uh, will transmit the power from the Woodruff K to the gear, and then the gear to the next <coughs> uh, elements. Okay, so that's uh, what this guy doing out here. <coughs> and then also you can see this is what we call a stepped shaft, and this is actually when you design a shaft. Generally, it's not a straight-through shaft. Okay, uh, it, it 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 could work, but uh, in order to uh, uh, locate elements, particularly you have more elements on it, you use a so-called step shaft here. Okay, so stepped. So see here, this is a step, and that that step is for the bearing, right? Okay, yeah. Okay, so that's uh, that example there. Okay, uh, some of the guidelines in terms of designing shaft. Okay. Now, first of all, as you're gonna see, is uh, this is that we actually did already some uh, the assignment questions in terms of designing shaft, right? It's, so it's not a brand new stuff at right here. Uh, one of the things that you gotta be careful is if uh, when you're comparing a long shaft and a shorter shaft, if uh, they they both in uh, basically under the same loading F, same value. Okay. If it's a longer shaft, then when you draw this bending moment diagram. Then uh, the uh, maximum bending moment, which happens right here, because it's longer length, so this guy here will have higher bending moment than the shorter shaft, right? Yeah. So that's sort of generalized. You want when you design a shaft, you uh, uh, you need to consider to minimize the length of the shaft. Okay. Yeah. Uh, also, another another shortcoming of a longer shaft is what deflection, right? Okay. 
So sh and also the sh longer shaft is, it'll present uh, more uh, difficulties in terms of alignment. Because so generally you just use two bearings. If it's a longer shaft, you have a uh, probably a problem of uh, a misalignment there. Okay. So keep it short. Uh, the second thing is, okay, we know that this, for example, this loading condition, we know that the maximum bending movement happens at here. Okay. So maximum bending movement happens at here, so that basically will cause a bending normal stress, right? So what you want to do is you need to avoid your stress concentration, okay, to be not here. So if you have, let's say, a fillet or groove or a case seat, okay, those are locations on the shaft which generally present very high stress concentration. So you don't want it to be here. The reason is because why is you already have a pretty big um, bending movement uh, here, right? And if you still if you have another stress concentration, your stress will just keep higher, right? And that basically presents a, a challenge for the uh, shaft diameter at that location. Uh, shaft layout, I think I said that already, and uh, generally you, you use it as a stepped cylinder kind of a shaft, right? Uh, if you can use a hollow shaft, and actually it, it's, it's better than a solid shaft because the mass is uh, smaller, right? Uh, mass smaller and then the stiffness will be higher, okay? So <clears throat> um, for low magnitude of force, the shoulders should be constructed with retaining rings in groove or clamp-on collars. Okay. Yeah. So in general, okay, it's best to support low carrying component between bearings, okay, rather than the cantilever uh, outboard of the bearing. So basically, uh, if you can put your component between the two bearings, you, then you do that. However, some, and you know this is not all the time because sometimes your shaft carries a, a pulley. So the pulley needs to be, you know, on the outside there. So in order to facilitate the assembly, so you're you need to have a little overhands right outside these two bearings location, right? So it's like uh, um, it's like this component here, okay? It's like this component, right? So if that has to be outside here, then what you need to do is you need to shorten this distance as much as possible. Okay, don't make it a very long cantilever beam at here. Okay, so to avoid deflection. Okay. And also, uh, you have to take into consideration of assembly. Okay, so how do you how do you maintain the system? So you cannot uh, s uh, design something at here and later there's no way to uh, uh, to to disassemble it, right? So at here. If this is the component that needs constant maintenance, so you put it outside there, right? Yeah. If this component doesn't, you put it inside, but it's still, uh, you, you, you need to think of uh, ease of uh, disassembling it, okay, like this. Okay. So this is actually why the reason uh, sometimes, uh, for this one here, it's a straight through right here, right? So sometimes there is another step at here, another step. So that's that the purpose of that step is actually for the ease of disassembling. Okay, so you don't need to slide all the way from here over here, right? If you have a uh, interference between this gear and uh, uh, the shaft, it'll present pretty uh, difficult, pretty much of a lots of difficulty in terms of sliding. But if you uh, just present a shoulder at here, right, it'll basically easier. Okay. Uh, where am I? Here, right? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Only two bearings should be used in most cases. Okay. So basically, you already you need to align the two bearings. You need to align the shaft. So if you have a, a more than two bearings, you essentially you have the so-called indeterminate system, and uh, also uh, more than two bearings, it's, it's the, the 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 alignment problem or the issue uh, will arise. Okay. So that's general, that's another guideline here. So look like this one here, um, the B is actually a solution. So if you look at the A at there, okay, so let's say you're you're supposed to design a shaft uh, carrying uh, two uh, gears and also supported by two bearings, right? So uh, what would be the possible layout of this uh, shaft to carry 
the three things that are here. So here's a solution. <clears throat> As you can see, it's a stepped shaft. And, uh, and the bearing is pressed against this shoulder, and that, that sorry, the gear, but the pinion is pressed against this shoulder, and the gear is pressed press this shoulder here, and there is a spacer, okay, between this gear and the bearing over here, okay, this is called a spacer. Now, uh, in real application, a lot of the time what we see is, if this is not a very big shaft, even if it's a big shaft, uh, sometimes this small bearing and the shaft, they are basically machined as a whole components. Okay, so uh, you can essentially machine this whole thing, this bearing, but uh, no, sorry, uh, this pinning plus the shaft as a whole component. Okay, yeah, so that uh, give you a, a basically a better structure. Okay, instead of uh, having uh, some extra component here in order to fix this pinning in the axial location, right? So actually, one of the students, in, uh, our past student, uh, graduate student, he works at a tech, and he sent me a whole bunch of pictures. And his job is to maintain uh, those uh, haul trucks and uh, some of the uh, some of the uh, manufacturing lines there. So he he has some pictures basically uh, showing all the uh, gear and the shaft problem in the haul truck system. They're very very big actually. Um, one of the picture shows is, is actually it's a big one, and there's a small pinion in it here. Basically, it's an integrated part of the pinion and the shaft all together, right? Yeah. So machining that kind of that, that kind of uh, uh, shaft and the pinion, uh, I I uh, I bet it's going to be a challenge. But uh, that's one way of doing it. Okay. So in case of axial load are not trivial, so what's axial load? Basically axial load is you may have a, some force okay, along this axial direction. So that force actually probably coming from where? Probably coming, let's say you, if you're using helical gear, then there is going to be a, an axial loading, right? We call that thrust load. So if that load is not trivial, basically it, you need to take care of that, all right? So then we have to have uh, thrust bearing okay, on either one side of this shaft to carry the load to the ground. So the load goes through the shaft to the bearing and, and then uh, through the housing, maybe the casing, and then to the ground. Right? There has to be a route for the flow of this force at here. Okay? However, as uh, as uh, going kind of pointed out here, uh, when you try to take care of the thrust load, okay, you only need, okay, you need only and only one bearing to take care of one direction. So you, let's say I have a thru thrust load in this direction here, okay, from this direction of the shaft. So you only need probably one uh, thrust bearing on this side here to take care of that. You don't need two bearings to take care of the same direction of uh, uh, thrust load, all right? Yeah. So you can have one side of the bearing okay, to take care of the thrust load in both directions. That's okay. Okay. Or you can have one, two bearings. This bearing takes the thrust load in this direction, and that bearing takes the thrust load in the other direction. Okay. But not two bearings taking care of one direction of thrust load. Okay. That's basically sort of principle. Okay. And also, uh, I'll show you a picture in the next days. Your um, your design or locating of the elements, particularly the shaft and the housing. There's always need, need to consider this as thermal expansion or the temperature effect on the shaft. So there's always a problem, particularly when you operate this at a high speed. There's going to be a temperature rise. Okay, even though you have lubrications, there's still going to be temperature rise and there's going to be a length change, right? So in order to take care of that, your uh, design needs to uh, to take that thermal expansion into account. So here's a, a, a picture taken from textbook. So this is a, a bevel gear, and this is the shaft. So the bevel gear will present thrust load on the shaft. So as you can see, in this particular case, they used only one bearing at here, so this bearing, to take care of the thrust load. Okay. So this bearing is placed against this shoulder, 
and there is the cover plate placed on the on the other side on the on the outer ring of this bearing and right here. Okay, so we're gonna learn the bearing later. So essentially this bearing will take care of the thrust load, okay, and actually in both direction. Okay. But this bearing here, you look at this the bearing at the top here, it's what we call it's a floating here. Because on this side, you see the inner ring on this side here, there is no fixture on this side here, right? There's no fixture. So that bearing doesn't take any uh, direction of axial load, okay? So if there is a thermal expansion of this uh, shaft here, and uh, that's actually the purpose of the bearing, so it, it can be taken care of that uh, issue there, right? Yeah, so that's the principle I was saying. Uh, you only need one and only one bearing to take care of the thrust load, okay? Usually the other side of the bearing, you leave it as a floating. Okay, to to, uh, uh, to take care of this uh, thermal expansion. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, that's the uh, uh, structure of this one here. Okay, bevel bear Q drive. Okay. To reduce stress concentration, so you have a stepped shaft. Then there is a geometry change, and uh, naturally you introduce this stress concentration, right? Yeah. So the stress concentration. Uh, to deal with that is, and we know that we can cut a little groove at this uh, stress concentration location. So there are different ways of cutting the groove or cutting a fillet. So you can cut a groove like this. This is inner cut, okay, at this shoulder location, or you can uh, have a little re so-called uh, relief groove at right here, okay, or you can have a relief groove over here, okay. So. What these what these things are doing basically they're reducing the stress concentration, okay? Yeah. Or you can just simply a fillet, right? A simply fillet, okay? Yeah. So I just want to okay, yeah, it's going on there. Yeah. Okay. So when you do the design, uh, you can if if you're um, using SolidWorks, I guess you're gonna have to uh, consider. Uh, whether you uh, which kind of structure you wanted to use, right? You had to machine, you had to basically model it yourself. Uh, if you're using AutoCAD Inventor, this is uh, the Design Accelerator. Okay, that Design Accelerator has has this feature. You can indicate: Do you need a, a stress relief groove at which location? Uh, what will be the radius of the stress relief groove? So that basically will automatically generate the uh, uh, stepped up sh uh, shaft for you, okay? If you use the AutoCAD Inventor, okay? Yeah. Shoulder of the shaft, okay? So we, we said we need to shoulder the shaft, and uh, we'll look at the example later. But there's a, this thing here is basically, okay, so how high would be the shoulder, right? How, how high should, should the shoulder be? Uh, in general, okay? The ratio between this capital D and small d is 1.5 to 1.2 to 1.5. Okay. Now there is a very good guideline is as we're going to learn the bearing. Uh, if you look into the catalog of the bearing, so bearing has this ball size, basically the the size of the inner diameter. Okay. So that's called ball size here, and there's another column here, which uh, they always exist in in uh, catalog of the bearing. It give you this so-called shoulder diameter here. So what's that? That's basically the diameter. This DS, that's the diameter of this. DH, that's the diameter of this guy here. So what 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 are these two for? So basically, they recommend that your shoulder at here is here. Okay, now don't be too high. Yeah, don't be too low like that, okay? And this DH right here, that's the recommendation of this locating housing. Basically, the locating this is the housing of the let's say the gearbox, right? And you you don't want it to be too low. If it's too low, that then the location goes into this uh, uh, seal location right here, right? That won't work, okay? Yeah. So those two parameter here, okay? They they actually will be part of the Design parameter you will consider when you design a shaft. You'll be able you you need to determine the shaft diameter, right? So how do we calculate the shaft diameter? As we're going to point it out, 
you can calculate your shaft diameter purely based on safety factor given, you know, like the midterm question, right? But that's not going to be probably your final answer. So you have to take care of this, take, take this, this uh, table here or the bearing parameter here into consideration, okay? So this is what I call uh, the, the design is the coupled uh, process. Why is it coupled? See, the, the tricky part is you, you're, you're going to design all the components, right? So the first step, you have the gear. I said you can start a gear now. But when you design a gear, you have this ball size of the gear, right? So basically, the, size, the, the ball size of the gear will determine what? The shaft size, okay? Or maybe the shaft minimum diameter will determine the ball size of the gear, okay? And the size, the ball size gear here, okay, of the of the diameter of the shaft, okay, needs to needs to uh, also satisfy the dimension from the bearing. But you haven't designed a bearing yet, right? So you got to design a bearing, pick a bearing first in order to get a ball size, okay? But the bearing design, as a later you will see that depends on the loading condition, depends on the the forces, okay, because the power transfer, because of the loading from the shaft. So uh, everything is coupled here. So if you if you look at this one here, you you probably will feel, you know, where should we start, right? But you got to start from somewhere, and then you have to probably have to come back to the beginning there after you finish one part, come back to the, uh, come back to it, and uh, probably you're gonna have to do a redesign, okay, based on other considerations. All right. <coughs> so that's one uh, little thing okay, uh, need to bear in mind. So the other concern is, okay, uh, there's this fillet radius at the shoulder location. There's also the fillet radius, okay, based on the bearing catalog. Then, my ears plug. Then apparently, what you need is what? The radius of the fillet, okay, of this corner of the bearing needs to be smaller or bigger? Huh? L larger, right? Needs to be larger than this fillet at this uh, uh, shoulder location, okay? Yeah. So that kind of little thing, uh, often in time, uh, we don't uh, pay too much attention to that. Uh, when we do the design of this thing here, uh, for example, the example I'm going to give it to you, uh, you initially, okay, what fillet radius shall we choose, right? And uh, we can choose starting from a very low value, okay, small value, for example, 0 0.01 inch like this, okay? But a very low value generally will present higher stress concentration though, right? Yeah. So that's another, another thing uh, when you... Uh, design your shaft, okay? Compatible, compatible with the bearing that you're gonna choose. But the problem is you haven't choose the bearing yet, so you don't know what to compatible with, right? Until you choose the bearing and you probably realize, oops, the shaft that we just designed, it's not good. And you come back to redesign the shaft. You redesign the shaft, you probably will see, oops, not to redesign, the safety factor is not satisfying anymore. So you can go back to redesign the bearing. So after bearing, go back to redesign. So sooner or later, you can come to one value which basically satisfies both. Okay. Yeah. Location of the case, okay, should be along the same reference line in order to avoid the twist. Okay. So here's a case. Here's a key location. Okay. This should be along the same reference line. There should be a chamfer at the end of the shaft to facilitate assembly. Okay, if this is a bearing, okay, there should be a chamfer here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, when I was working as uh, as a controls engineer, uh, the mechanical engineer's job was design uh, a system, and one of the uh, the system is basically a robot that grabs a, a wheel and then place the wheel into a hole, right? So um, <laughs> there was a little one very little thing is how how would you if the the robot has to be precise at the top, or if just a little bit twisted and the wheel won't go into the hole. So one of the simple solution is you create a chamfer at the hole location. So even if the wire is not perpendicularly perfectly perpendicular to the hole, you can still slide it into it, right? Yeah. 
Uh, in general, if you look at uh, the previous diagram, there is this uh, gear carried by the shaft, the shoulder location. Now, there might be good ideas uh, to have a slightly protrusion here, okay, to basically the gear hub. It's slightly longer than the shoulder, just slightly, okay, very small. Now, uh, the reason because maybe there is a spacer, okay, uh, here trying to fix this gear to its location. So this way you you have a rigid basically contact between the spacer and the gear. Right? Yeah. So if you if you manufacture, if you design this gear and this shaft shoulder to be basically the width here to be exactly the same. So because of the uh, maybe the error, maybe the gear is actually slightly smaller than the uh, uh, the shoulder width at here, right? So in that case, you actually, uh, there's no contact between the spacer and uh, uh, the gear. Okay. Improving load condition. So if you look at this left side here, the left, that's the left side here. Uh, suppose this is your input gear, and the three at here are output gears, okay? Then the input has a certain torque at here, so It'll be share one, two, three. Basically, the output torque T one, T two, T three, right at here. So now, if I, if you draw a torque diagram, okay, basically you cut everywhere here, and then you look at it to one direction. So that's what it look like here, right? That's what it look like. And this is a T one. That's your input torque at this. Okay. So apparently, this is basically a very uh, the biggest value here. Okay, somewhere here. So that's not very good because why? Because maybe you can uh, move one of the output gear over here, right? Over here. So after you do this one here, then what happens is if you cut it, okay, here, do the cutting at a cross section and you look at into that direction. So that's T3. When you cut it here, when you cut it here, this is the basically T1, the input torque, right? The input torque. Now when you cut it here, it's going to be the input minus this one here, right? So that the value or the height at here, it will be smaller than this one here now. That makes sense? Yeah. So the arrangement of the elements on the shaft, right, matters. Okay, matters. Of course, if you're just uh, carrying a couple, uh, just only one, then it doesn't matter, right? If you carry more, then you need to take this into consideration. Because the higher torque and then will result in a, com a higher combined stress, okay? Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's look at this example right here, because based on what we just said, because some of them are not covered yet, but uh, this is not a good design, first of all, okay? So look at this one here. Can you point out a few uh, problems based on this drawing here? Now, what would be a problem? Uh, come on, sorry, come again. All the bearings on either side of the, uh, the central component are opposing each other. That might be a problem. The bearings on the two sides? If those are bearings. You mean these two? Yeah. Uh, what's wrong with these two? Um, if you, in the other action point, you had one truss bearing and the other one was just a floating. So would that <coughs> cause any problem? Good point. So you're saying is uh, they are both sides here are rigidly fixed at here, right? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So the only question is how would you uh, basically modify that situation? Okay. Yeah. So that that's that's a good point. I'll, you'll see how would you modify that later. Okay. Yeah. So any other problem here? These are not aligned. Yes. Which one not aligned? The K seat, right? Was it you're just saying the K seat? Yeah. So the two cases are not aligned. They want you want them aligned along the same center line here. Anything else? <laughs> Excellent. So you want this one to be a little bit uh, protruded here, right? Yeah. What else? So you look at the shoulder height compared to this inner ring here. 
that's a bit of too high, right? That's too high here. Okay? Yeah. So one of the the guideline is the shoulder here, it will be somewhere at this location. Okay. So similarly, what about this guy? What's this one? This is what we this is a so-called spacer here, right? This one is a spacer. So this spacer here compared to this, the height of the spacer compared to this inner ring at here, that's also a little bit too high. Okay, so that the height of this spacer and the height of this shoulder, they need to be modified. Yeah. Now, uh, when you say that uh, the height of mm -hmm. the spacer and the height of the shoulder are yeah. uh, incorrect, uh, this is in an optimization sense. It's, it's structurally that isn't a bad thing, it's just excess material. That's what um, well, you could have a potential problem. Well, this one here might be okay because this is a uh, this bearing here may be okay. But if you're using, let's say, a ball bearing, mm -hmm. then uh, the inner ring and outer ring they are basically on the same uh, line here. Mm -hmm. Then the heightness of this spacer, right? Instead of touching the metal part, it'll touch this seal part, which is the non-metal part, right, or non-rotating part, right? There's in the middle. There's a seal there. Okay, or even just uh, open space, right? So that's not gonna uh, be a good idea because you can have a friction uh, by touching those non-rotating components. Okay, yeah. Okay, what else? So this guy here is what we call what? This is the uh, cover here, right? This is the cover for the gearbox. Okay, and this is gonna be a metal. But right now, this metal and this shaft is actually touching, right? So you don't want them to touch because the shaft is rotating. So here, you need to be untouched. But however, you don't want oils in it to lick it out. So there's going to be uh, some kind of a seal at it here. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So that's another part. And what else? If you look at this case seat right here, what do you think of that case seat? It's too big, right? It's it's longer than the shoulder right here. It's too big. Okay? Yeah. So um, in general, sometimes we also need okay a seal over here. Okay, so between this plate cover and uh, the housing case. Okay, so this one, this one. Okay, so this next one is shows you basically a modified uh, structure. Okay, <coughs> based on the previous one there. Okay, and this is a little chamfer. Does the previous one have a chamfer? Yeah, it ha does have a chamfer, but it's uh, touching this uh, uh, this this cover here, right? So that's what happens there. So back to that, uh, the question of the bearing uh, problem. So what happens is you create a little bit of a space at here, a okay, very a small gap, okay, to give this axial uh, possibility of axial thermal expansion. Okay, so that's or oh, sometimes you can use a seal at here, very soft plastic kind of material. Okay, and you can also remove certain amount of material on the on the cover, okay, which is not that critical. Okay, so this is essentially one of the structure uh, for a sh uh, for a shaft. This is actually it could be one of the structure that you use for uh, your single stage single single stage uh, gearbox design. So you have the pinning on the top, and you have the gear at here, or maybe this is the pinning. Who knows, right? Yeah. So when you design your shaft, number one step is to design the layout of the shaft. So one of the assignments that you're going to do this week or uh, is to draw to sketch the layout okay, of the shaft. Okay. And roughly also you don't need the length of each side each portion of the layout, okay, but uh, you need the layouts of the shaft first. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we have to take care of the stress concentration. Uh, stress concentration needs to be taken care of. But there's this problem is uh, stress concentration cannot be calculated if you don't know your radius, fillet radius, if you don't know the diameter here, if you don't know the diameter here, right? 
in order to design, you know you need to know the KT, but you don't know this capital D and the D yet. So that's basically a challenge. So in order to start the design, so we have to assume certain kind of certain value of the stress concentration. So that's what we call initially you need to come up with a certain estimation of the stress concentration. For example, a st est estimation of stress concentration at the fillet. So what would be a possible value to estimate? So we said we if I take R over D point zero two one point five, so that's about two point seven area here, right? You can always use a larger value than two point seven to be more conservative at the beginning. Okay. An example I use, I think uh, I use a three or something. Okay. Yeah. So that's called estimation. Same thing if you have a thunder torsion, you should you can also start. But if you look you look at the diagram here, uh, when you use this combination and uh, the value for the KTS is about two point two at here. Okay. So you can start from 2.2. So that's a pretty conservative value to start with, right? Yeah. And the other location of the stress concentration is the K-sit. Generally, K-sit uh, stress concentration are much higher than even than the fillet uh, at the shoulder. So how do we determine the K-sit uh, stress concentration then? The textbook doesn't have this diagram. And uh, you can look at my lecture notes regarding this diagram in here. Uh, it gives you this KTKS based on certain ratios of R over D, like this. Okay? Yeah. Now, but the textbook uh, does give you a figure, of which I'll show you later. Okay? It gives you a figure uh, to uh, start this uh, a starting value for the KT and the KTS based on uh, R over D equal to 0 0.02. Yes. Right. Would you then provide this chart on the final? Yes. Yes. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. But you already, um, as in the midterm, um, just to be everybody on the same page, then I'll probably just let you know what the stress concentration is if there's a question like that. Okay. So <clears throat> maximum value from the figure is about four. So you can start from four. Right. That's a very very conservative. Right. Starting from, starting from uh, at this value 4 doesn't mean that it will be 4. So as you're going to see example, you start from stress concentration 4. And then you will end up with a certain shaft diameter. So you, you, you're going to probably come back again. Once you get the D, once you get R, you will have a precise the value of R over D. So you can calculate this exact value of the KT or KTS again. Okay? So that's called iterative process. So this figure is uh, more or less the figure given in the textbook, but it's actually not exactly the same. The textbook value is not quite the same. I find a different source uh, give uh, different values for the stress concentration for the case seat. Uh, but however, there are basically two different kind of ways of manufacturing the case seat. One is called a sled runner case seat, okay, and the other is the profile uh, case seat here, okay. So th or this is also called AMIL case KV. Uh, the AMIL KV there will be uh, a stress concentration at this root location of the case state. And that root location generally uh, is because of the, f the, the radius of the cutting tool. Okay? Yeah. So those are another resource for the KT and the KTS. Okay. And this is a textbook diagram here. Okay? The textbook <coughs> recommends your first iteration KT, KTS. Okay? Uh, you can resort to this figure table 7-1. So for example, if you're looking at the shoulder fillet, your first round of a KT KTS can be 2.7, 2.2, and axle loading 3.0. So which one you, you want to choose? You don't have to pick this value here. You can pick a little bit higher and that's fine, okay? Yeah. But that's a guideline. If the AMIL case it, okay, and you can pick a 2.143 like this for bending and a torsion. So if you compare this value with the table I give it here, it's actually different, right? They're actually different. Okay? Yeah. So which one is more accurate? Not sure. Okay. So but this is estimate anyway, right? It's estimate. Okay. So that's estimation here, okay? Yeah. Shaft design mostly is for fatigue loading. Okay, so we do have a static loading of shaft, right? 
uh, if it's a fatigue loading, so there's a handout, okay, uh, giving you it here. And it has summarized okay, the design equation for static loading and fatigue loading. So the top four rows here okay, are equations for static loading, and everything below that is for dynamic loading. Now, when you come to dynamic loading, okay, you, know, you gotta basically use the right equation. Okay, use the right equation. Right equation meaning uh, what kind of a loading condition do we have? Right. So your first column there, okay, tells you this uh, loading condition. Okay. So for example, here. It says if TA equal to MM equal to zero, a uh, different criteria has this formula here. Was that good? Yeah. What's a TA? What's MM anyway? What is TA? What is what does TA and MM here represent? No. So if you have a shaft, yeah, bend your movement and what? And torque, right? So if you have a shaft, it's probably under torsion, and it's probably under F right here, and the t the shaft is rotating, right? So uh, if the shaft is rotating, if even if the F is a constant, then you would have basically MA value, but MM is probably going to be zero, right? Yeah. But if this, the, and then there's this torque here. If the torque is a constant, if the, this T is constant, then the TA is going to be what? If T is constant, the TA is zero, and TM is not zero, right? TA is the alternating component. TM is the mean component. Same thing. Subscript M is the mean component and A is the alternating component. Right? Okay? So uh, when you use this diagram here, okay, uh, make sure that you understand what kind of a loading your system have. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there the this last one here is probably the most the generic one there. It has the torsion, the bending, the axial and then there's also mean value. Okay, this is the thing. But there, I only have a DE elliptic listed here. Okay, yeah. So if you're designing using spur gear, would you have axle loading on the shaft? No, no. Yeah. So you won't use this. And you're probably just going to use those equations out of here, right? And maybe even this. But if you're using helical gear, then you would have axle loading. So your only choice is going to be this one here. Okay? Is that good? Yeah. So what I've just covered are pretty much all the uh, all the things that I uh, wanted to say. Uh, basically, when you come to the design, okay. When it comes to design, uh, design building basically means uh, I give you the safety factor, but I don't give you the material, I don't give you everything else. Uh, you probably will have the loading condition, okay? Uh, loading condition based on the power transmitted, okay? So then all you need to do is, okay, you need to figure out the diameter of the shaft, okay? Uh, of course, you're probably going to pick a material first, okay, to satisfy the safety factor. So that's the uh, that's the design process. Uh, in terms of the safety factor, there are certain guidelines re regarding uh, what will be a proper safety factor for different application. Okay, so just this is basically some generic things out here. Okay, and the design equation is what I give you there. there these are the design equations that we're going to use. Okay, but we're going to use this combined loading condition. So instead of a sigma a, it's going to be sigma a prime, it's sigma m prime. Okay, it's combined loading. Is that good? Yeah. So that's uh, some generic general development. Uh, so basically, how that equation is derived in the handout. Okay. 
uh, based on the stress. So those are actually not new. Okay, those are basically exactly um, what you have done. Okay, uh, before the midterm. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of the one of the questions in the midterm is to calculate uh, the D, right, based on the given uh, stress condition. Okay. The equation actually, and you can also use this equation to do this calculation. Okay, yeah, but in your you can also calculate separately. Okay, that is all good. All good. Any questions? Yeah. So there are a lot of things to digest digest it here. So I'm gonna uh, use an example uh, to go over to go over this uh, shaft design here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's always assistive tools, and you will have uh, uh, an Excel template. Actually, I think I have a, you have a template already regarding the endurance limit, fatigue cycles, right? So those can be recycled. Uh, the uh, example I'm giving to you, uh, there's also an Excel, okay, uh, associated with that. You can also use that. There's also software that you can make use of. There's a little software called MD, M Design. That's I'm not, not, not that software. I don't really have it actually. Uh, I think that's a software. Uh, you can check that. That's not a very uh, comprehensive software, but the the best one so far I've seen is the, the AutoCAD Inventor Design Accelerator. Okay, so Design Accelerator essentially you don't you don't need to draw this. You can just uh, tell the the Design Accelerator. So I need this step right here. I need the key theta here. And what will be the radius? I need the nut. You know, I need a, a stress relief groove. So it'll generate everything for you. Okay. And you're putting the load. You're putting the load on the at a different location, and uh, and they actually will do the calculation. Will tell you whether this this the the shaft diameter is safe or not. Okay. Yeah. But uh, having said this, uh, I don't want you to basically. You, you can use this absolutely good. Okay. Practice. <coughs> but when it comes to the project, I need you to I need to see some kind of a hand calculation there. <coughs> okay. Just to show that. Uh, you did act, you did the process, not the computer did the process. Okay, yeah. Okay, so now let's take a look at the example here. Okay, let's take an example that uh, uh, that I give it to you. The first page. Okay, the handouts in the first page here. Okay. So this example here, I'm not going to go over the details example, but I'll go over the design process. Okay, for this example here. Okay, so. Uh, given this thing here, well, how how shall we proceed in terms of the design of shaft? So this example is a shaft, okay, uh, carrying a gear at here, okay, and then there is a shave, okay, that's pretty much the picture I uh, showed uh, in, in one of the slides there. <clears throat> All right, uh, the gear will be have an action reaction force. Okay, from the kinging, so that's Fg, that's what we call resulted load. Okay, and the pulley. Okay, there's a pulley on the shift, so there is the pulley has the tension on two sides. Okay, are slightly different. Okay, actually by a factor of a five. So there's F1 and F2. So that, that's basically the loading condition. Okay, or the free body diagram at here. Right, free body diagram. Now we already have the layout, and we have the dimension or the lengths for each portion of the layout. The only thing that we don't have in this question is the diameter, okay, of each portion of the layout. Right? Yeah. So that's the uh, challenge part. The shaft is supported by two bearings that are here. Okay. Uh, to make assumption here, to make it simple, so in this question, the supporting force, instead of at the center of the bearing, and in this example, they actually put the supporting force right at this edge of the bearing at here. Okay, right at this edge. So in your design, and I would just say you need to put your supporting force at the center of the bearing. So in other words, you're gonna uh, take this width of the bearing into consideration. So when you, after you pick the bearing, then you have the width, right? Then you would uh, have this one here. But the problem is, when you design the shaft, you don't have the bearing yet. 
right? <laughs> so how would you do that? There's always basically you can do a little approximations at the beginning, okay? Yeah. So which means after everything is determined, the practice is to go back, to come back and recalculate everything, okay? To give the precisely the value based on all the updated components. Okay. So in this case here, uh, they choose the, the supporting force right at these two edge at here. Okay? Yeah. Was that good? Yeah. So now the question is designed now. Okay. So when you look at this one here, uh, first is what will be okay, well what what do we need to determine, right? I guess we need to determine D naught, D1, D2 and d3 so we need to determine these two here these three these four parameters so i'll use this one here so first four okay what to determine okay so d naught d1 d2 and d3 okay in your particular case if you design a shaft uh, you don't have the you you have the layout, but you have to probably uh, approximately you what how, what's the length of each portion of the layout that you want it to, right? That also has to be done at the beginning. So that is that going to be your final length of the layout? Maybe not, or maybe, okay? Yeah. So that's needed there. Second of all, <coughs> so if I wanted to design define uh, uh, find the diameter here so the question is uh, what information okay what information do we need okay for those di at here okay what information do we need okay so for this for this example here let's look at the loading condition this fg is going to be a constant and these two f are going to be a constant so basically there's a constant load on the shaft and the shaft is rotating so then you would have what complete reversed bending moment right bending moment in other words you have ma not zero but mm is zero and there is a torque or power trans transformation so if you look at this diagram here where does the what where, where uh, which portion does the torque exist Which portion has the torque on the shaft? Between here and where? And this, right? And this. That's where you have the torque. So the torque is going to be constant. So basically the TM, not zero, but TA is zero, right? So based on this information, so M a not zero m m zero t a zero t m not zero so now you can pick your design equation d right pick design equation so you look at your diagram here let's say i want to use uh, goodman right i want to use goodman here so i guess i have already that d equal the the one which one is that so we can use I guess we can use this one here, right? We can use this. That makes sense? Okay. So if I copy and paste this one in here, okay. uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, actually, I used the, did I use the D Goodman here? Yeah. Uh, I used the D Goodman here. But if, if, you, if you choose, say, oh, can I use this equation here? Well, look this one. You know, you say, can we use this equation? This equation here. Actually, you can't, right? Actually, you can't. All you need is just basically this TA0 and MM0, right? So that'll give you back this this equation it should. Make sense? OK, yeah. OK, so let's just say. I'm going to copy paste this guy here, the more generic equation in here. Okay. That's uh, a little bit too small. Okay. 
So if you look at this equation here, so d equal to you know a whole bunch of uh, factors okay, on the other side. Okay, on the other side here. So you look at this one here. What do we know in order to calculate the d at here, right? In order to calculate d, m a t a and m m t m. That's the loading condition that will be able to determine, right? Because we have the force. What's the force? It's giving here. We have the force here. You will be able to determine this force and these two here, right? You'll be able to determine based on the giving condition. Once you have this, you can draw free body diagram. You will be able to determine the loading condition. So from the loading condition, you will be able to determine what MA is, what MM is, and what TA and what TM is. Okay. So so let me write it down here. So loading condition, loading F to MA TA uh, not TA TM. Okay. This will be known. Okay. This will be known. Okay. So I'm not going to do the calculation. Actually, we did all the exercise, combine loading, right? Yeah. If this is known now, let's look at this one here. Safety factor N, that's going to be given. So in this question, it's given the desired is uh, uh, 2.5. So that N is 2.5. So that's also known now. And what about this KF, KFS, and KF, and, and basically, yeah, we apply the KF, KFS to the same thing to the mean value on alternating value. So this KF and KFS, are they known or unknown? They are actually unknown, right? Why? What does the KF, KFS depends on? This Kf is the fatigue stress concentration factor that equal to 1 plus Q and then what? Kt minus 1, right? Kt minus 1. So this Kf depends on the Kt and the Q. And what is the Q? Q is the notch sensitivity factor. And what does the Q depends on? The Q equal to 1 over 1 plus root A over root R. That was the root R. Hmm? Yeah. So A is the Newberg constant, and R is what? The radius of the fillet. So if we don't know the fit, the, the question didn't tell you what the radius of fillet is. So basically, we don't know the Q exactly, right? Yeah, we don't know the Q. And we don't know the Q, we don't know the KT, and so we don't have the KF at this stage. Is that, is that good? Yeah. OK, so. What about this this value here, S E? So S U T is known. This S E at here. So this S E, what does S E equal to? That equal to K A, K B, and S E prime, right? S E prime. So uh, S E prime depends on the on the material. So the question tell you you need to use a uh, you need to use a shaft. Let's see. The question tell you material. I think. Yeah, I did it. Where's the material? Well, the question didn't uh, tell the material, so I guess we need to pick a material, right? We need to pick a material. So uh, S E prime, okay, depends on material here. Okay, so that that's okay. So you pick a material, right? Let's say you pick a kind of steel there. Okay, so let's say you pick, uh, if you pick AISI 1020, so in this question I use a 1020 there, and uh, then we can calculate SE prime. So that's going to be 0 0.5 SUT, right? Okay. However, uh, the, the marine factors, KA, KB, and maybe KC, KD, those factors, what do they depend on? Ka is the surface condition. So the surface condition, once you pick the material, let's you uh, hard drawn or something else, so that can be calculated, right? Okay, that won't change actually once you pick. But the Kb, if you recall that, Kb depends on what? It's a size factor. So Kb is actually a function of a uh, diameter, right? It's a function of diameter. But diameter we don't know yet, so we can't calculate the Kb, okay? But you do you can't assume the key the, the diameter are within certain range. If it is within certain range, uh, maybe it's between 
uh, um, uh, two inch or one inch or something like that. So we can use this formula from the textbook. Okay, so that's your key B. So it's a function of D. Then overall A, this S E is a function of D, right? It's a function of D. Okay. So then if I go back to this equation here, so D equal to a whole bunch of expression in here. And that turned out this D is a function of what? Of itself. So that whole expression turned out to be D equal to a function of D. Okay? <laughs> no? Well, for starters, what does SE depends on? As we just determined, SE depends on the KB. And KB depends on the D. So this is a function of a D, right? So the D value will appear at here. It'll appear here. So maybe D equal to 16N over pi, uh, I don't know, maybe D cubed or whatever, right? So this whole right side here, this whole right side is going to be a function of D. So that's what I written in here. Okay, like this. Okay. So D is a function of D. It's actually going to be a function of a nonlinear function. But we're solving for the D. So that's a dilemma, right? Yeah. And uh, you can use some kind of a nonlinear solver to do it. Okay. But uh, fortunately, uh, we can use Excel to do a little so-called linear programming to solve it. Okay. And which is what I'm going to show you uh, now. Okay. Yeah. Was that good? However, if you look at this expression here, that's what I call a challenge. Okay. If you look at this expression in here, the challenge is you have to start with a D in order to solve this guy here. You know what I'm saying? Basically, you have to start the D. Let's say maybe I call oh, D is one inch. Okay, D is one inch. Once you start the D now, you, you get the ball rolling. Then you plug this guy here. Plug into this function. You will be get able to get a solution out of this one here. Okay, so this if this is your D1, you plug it here. Your second step, you get a D2, right? Then you plug a D2 back again. You will get a D3. That make sense? So you plug the D3 back to it again. You get a D4. The not not the D4 size. It's a, the fourth step size, right? Sooner or later, actually not a sooner, just two steps usually. It'll converge. Okay. Yeah, Tyler. Oh, I was actually just gonna ask. Would you, how long would you have? Do you just keep going until it? Three steps. It'll converge. Oh. Yeah. Uh, if your initial guess is way out of the bounds, then you probably takes a bit more, a few more steps. Yeah. You'll see that uh, in Excel. It's very, very straightforward. Okay. Yeah. But that's the process, though. Okay, that's the process, and that's basically what design means. Design, you have so many unknown variables. You gotta start somewhere, and it's gonna be an iterative process. Okay. Yeah, and that's how you're gonna end up with the solution. Right. Yeah. So uh, let me basically show you the roughly the process that uh, I did for this question right here. Okay. As I said, I'm not gonna go over this whole calculations by hand for every steps, and you can take a look at this document. Okay. Uh, at your at your own pace. Okay. First step, as we said, we need to figure out the mo uh, the binary moment diagram and uh, torque diagram. Basically, we need to draw figure out where the critical location is, right? And that's purely based on the loading condition F G, F one, F two value. And F G can be calculated based on the horsepower and the speed. Okay. So what is the FG here? That's basically like the resultant force, right? So first step is to figure out is the transmitted load. Then FG cosine 20 is the transmitted load. So transmitted load divided by cosine 20 is FG. 
So that's what happens at here. Okay. Yeah. So torque equal to this. Okay. Transmit load equal to this. The radial load is this, and uh, then the W is WR square plus WT square square root. Okay. Yeah. Uh, F, the pulley, F1, F2, are scaled, has a scale difference of 5. Scale difference 5 in here. So F, F1, torque generated from F1 minus torque generated from M2 should equal the torque generated by the, the transmit load, this horizontal force at here. So you can calculate the component F1 and F2. All right? So once you figure this thing out now, you can draw the, the uh, the free body diagram in the two planes, xy plane and xz plane, okay, to figure out the supporting force at the bearing location. So one is in the y direction, one in the x direction, right? That's basically the typical process we have done in the assignments, okay? Once you get all the components, you can draw the bending moment diagram, okay, in the two planes like this, okay? So bending moment diagram. Then you can also draw the torque diagram, and you can. This is a combined bending moment diagram like this, but this is not that necessary. Okay, it's not necessary. So you will see that the critical, the maximum bending moment diagram, bending moment happens at this location, uh, which is basically the location C at here. Okay, location C. Okay, and location C happened to be the location having a fillet, so that's probably going to be the most critical location, okay? Now, the other critical location is a K-seat location here. Because K-seat generally has pretty small radius, so that's have a high, having a higher stress concentration factor. So we need to look at this location at here. In the example, it also, look at, it also looked at this fillet location, okay, at this shoulder here, okay? Where did the red... Where did the red thing go? Okay, and right here. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So that's called the D location. So basically, we're going to look at the B, uh, not B actually, looking at the K state, C location, and the D location. Okay. So we're not going to look at the B location anymore. The B location is just right outside this K state, and in general, that's not going to be as critical as the K state. And the A location has a fillet, but we're not going to look at it anymore because why? Because there's no torque at it here, right? There's no torque, okay? And only bending moment, and it's, just, and it's actually pretty small, okay? So that's the three critical location. To determine the critical location, you you got to determine the stress concentration factor for those critical location. And the KT value we assumed to be a very conservative, 3.52 and 4 as a starting value for the KT. The Q value, which is the notch sensitivity factor, depends on the radius of this uh, stress concentration location. So the radius R, initially in this example, they pick 0 0.01 okay, as, a, as, a, as a conservative value. So then you can calculate your Q value. That makes sense? Okay. So K, KF, KFS will be able to calculate it. Then your loading condition. Okay, can give you this, okay, MA and TM, so this whole portion can be calculated, right? Can be calculated. And SE, you can calculate some of them once you have the material selected, but not the size factor. Size factor depends on the size, right? So that's basically end up with the final equation of this. I'll show you what I did in the Excel right here. Okay, so this is basically all the drawing right here. And uh, this is the bending moment at each one of the location. Here's the material property. Okay. And uh, the Ka, okay, based on a, a certain kind of a machined uh, surface. So Kb, we keep it uh, as a function out of here. So Kc, Kd, Ke, assuming all one. Okay. It's a combined loading. That's why Kc is one. So Se is this guy here. So we end up with the SE as a function of 25.51 d to the power of this. It's a function of d, right? So then in the end, calculate the Q, okay, all the, all the things given. Initial guess of the stress concentration factor, K 
calculate the key F and the key FS at the different locations, okay, at the critical location. Now it's time to try to find the diameter. First, what, we, what I did is to find the diameter at the location C. The location C is the location having the highest bending moment. So this is the formula D equal to this whole bunch, right? Plugging everything here. So if you look at the cell, okay, if you look at the cell here, uh, where is it? Uh, here, right hand side. This guy, the cell at here. Look into the formula here, okay? The formula, that's the formula basically uh, based on this guy here, okay? Based on this. So this formula has that D there. So this is what I said. We start with the initial gas of this D. Start with the initial gas. So plugging this value okay, into the expression at here, okay? Plug it into the expression, okay? Basically plug it into this KB, plug it into this SE, you will be able to calculate your first step. After you plug it in, you will be able to get a value out of this expression. And out of this value here, then you plug this one back here, then do another iteration, okay? Another iteration. So this is the same formula. So you end up this one here. You two iterations, it doesn't change anymore. So this is going to be 0.557. Is that good? Yeah. So 0.557 not going to be the final decision. And uh, here's the final decision. And this value is based on what? So because where is the D, the C location? Let's look at the C location here. C location is the location carrying this bearing here, right? Carrying the bearing. So your D is 0.557. So if you look at the bearing catalog and the next biggest size for the bearing, okay, this is inch series. So your bearing catalog gives you the SI unit. It's a 20 millimeter. So that's 0.559. Okay, so that's how the D at here, which is D2, is determined. That makes sense? Okay, yeah. Once you have the D2 at here, your D3, okay, you can calculate D3 based on the two things. So your D2, which is this, and D3, which is this. Okay, which is this. So your D2 over D3 suggested, let's say, if you use 1.2, so you have a, you can have a suggested value D3. But however, D3 should also be calculated based on the loading condition. Okay, based on the loading condition, the load distribution. So in the Excel, it does the calculation of D3. Okay, it turned out to be 0.444, which is the minimum uh, value. So you can pick your D3 based on this 0.444 and or this expression at here. Okay, so you can choose one at here. If this value based on this is is smaller than this, then you just choose this. All right? Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. So there are different uh, reasons, different uh, things you need to consider before you make a final decision. Right? Similarly for the other uh, part of this shaft. Any question? So there, I, uh, there are um, at least five documents associated with this lecture. So take a look at each one of them. Okay. Uh, the pace is a little bit fast, but the reason is uh, a lot of things here are not new. The, the key idea is to have this design concept here. Right? Yeah. Thank you.